Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Big Time Strength Podcast. Today, I have a special guest on. This is someone that has truly been making the big time where he's at for a long time. And he's trying to elevate coaches around the nation and, and give them a platform and a way to make their sport the funnest that it can be, and then also help athletic performance coaches uh, reach their peak potential. And that's Tony Holler. You may have heard of him, Feed the Cats. Um, and I'm excited to dive into this episode. Before we get there, let's um, have a word from our sponsors or, or make sure that we recognize them. Because I, I was talking to Gage and Amanda here recently, and it's crazy. For years now, these people have sponsored us. And that is a really cool deal, a really cool um, testament to our sponsors. Super thankful for them. The first one's Team Builder. Um, Team Builder is the leading software for high schools and colleges, providing coaches the ability to write programs online, generate over 13 reports, and even train athletes remotely for side income. Right now, if you sign up with code BIGTIME, you'll receive an, a free APRE programming template, which will work automatically within Team Builder. No more spreadsheets and workout cards to track training maxes that change day by day. Automate your programming without outsourcing your programming with Team Builder. So once again, thank you for Hewitt and the, and the gang. Hewitt actually stepped up and is, uh, is sponsoring our clinic, our, our in-person clinic that we're going to have on March 27th. So I'll give you a little bit more information on about that in just a little bit. But thank you so much to Team Builder and everything that they do. Our second sponsor um, is Powerlift. Powerlift is the leading manufacturer and distributor of heavy-duty strength training equipment for collegiate and high school athletic performance centers around the world. Powerlift brings over 20 years of experience to the strength and conditioning world. All products are manufactured in the state-of-the-art manufacturing facility in Jefferson, Iowa. They are proud to support all coaches making it big time where they're at. And Mike Richardson's our show contact for that. Um, and, and Powerlift has been awesome. I've worked with them. Uh, I have to think back now. It's been close to 10 years, I think, that, that I've worked with Powerlift. And, and one of the things that, um, that I truly find awesome about them is they're solutions-based and they want to find what works best for your situation. Um, we're redoing a middle school uh, weight room at, uh, at Mount Vernon and working with one of the rep reps. Um, Tim O'Neill, he's a great guy. He's our area rep and um, just jumping in and, and working with him has always been a pleasure. So thanks to Team Builder. They're also sponsoring our in-person clinic. So once again, these sponsors can't say enough about them. And then the last thing before we get to Coach Holler and what everybody's actually here for, um, we are having a clinic on March 27th at Mount Vernon High School in Mount Vernon, Iowa. If you want to know more information about that, you can check out the show notes. Uh, I don't want to uh, hold you too long with that, but the whole idea is once again, we want coaches to be able to present to others and, and help them out in their field. But the biggest thing we want to do is we want coaches to be able to connect with others that are making the big time where they're at, where they are watering the grass, where they're at, where they are, where their feet are. And super excited for that. Last year, didn't get to have it because of COVID. This year, with all regulations and making sure that we follow all protocols, I'm super excited for it. So Stay tuned for that and more information. Check that out in the show notes. Now, the moment that we've been waiting for, uh, Coach Holler. Coach Holler, thank you for coming on the podcast. Well, thank you, Preston. Uh, Coach, you know, I've, I've listened to a lot of your podcasts. I know a lot of your background. And some of our listeners probably have listened to a lot. But what's some of the things from your background that you might want people to know before we jump in to what it looks like for, for what you do and, and how you're doing um, some big time things? Well, I think that um, some people that maybe have just heard about me in the last couple of years picture me as this national figure and international speaker. I actually spoke in England and Ireland last year, you know, so I put that on my resume. I'm an international speaker, um, man of mystery. So, um, but I, I think the most important thing is that, um, that I am probably just like most of your audience that I toiled in obscurity my entire 40 year coaching career. I, I, I tell the funny story that uh, um, I, I, I'd actually uh, uh, made the Illinois Hall of Fame track and field and uh, wrote a killer article and uh, for uh, Simply Faster. And, and I got called in for my teacher evaluation and, and she was telling me that I was one of the five excellent teacher ratings in the whole school. And I was like walking out like on air. And she asked me how my baseball team was going to be this spring. And, and I, I didn't know what to say. You know, I'm the track coach, you know? So I said, well, it all depends on the pitching, you know? So, um, 
so Mike Boyle says that the definition of an expert is somebody with a uh, hundred miles from home with a PowerPoint. And so, so a lot of this stuff, you know, my, my podcast, my writings, my clinic appearances, you know, I was just a uh, chemistry teacher that closed his door and taught chemistry. And, and um, most of my career, I coached basketball. I was a head basketball coach in the eighties um, and I was a football coach, but most of my career, I coached track and field, which it's like the stepchild of, of high school sports. It's, it's right on the same level of wrestling and cross country that, you know, nobody buys a ticket to see those sports, you know, it's like, uh, but that was kind of the beauty of it as well. So I, I think that's, that's the most important thing is that uh, when people hear me talk, I, I am not, you know, like the head coach at, Notre Dame or, you know, I don't work for Altus or something, you know, I'm just, I'm just a teacher at a high school or I used to be a teacher. I'm retired now. You know, I think maybe that's why I can relate so much to the stories that you tell and, and the articles that you put out. And I, I truly have enjoyed just kind of seeing how this has all played out. Cause when I first heard about you, this was revolutionary, but honestly, to me, what I experienced up to this point, Everything was just countercultural to that point. And, and now that I've been around it a lot, I just want to know more of the intricacies, the more of the things like not everybody's situation is the same, right? I just love listening to the podcast, reading your articles, and just seeing the progression of thought with it. Because this is not just a, a simple, simplified version of track practices. This is a way that you are training people to be the fastest that they've ever been maybe the most explosive because of that, you know, it's almost synonymous and it's spilling over to other sports, right? How many articles are you writing now about football, about basketball? I've, I just listened to um, your podcast about cross country and what it looks like for, you know, middle distance, maybe fours and eights a little bit more um, and then spilling over into, into um, 5Ks and what that really looks like. And so um, I love all of that and where that goes. And there's, there's some things that have been controversial around along the way. And, and maybe we'll dig into that a little bit just to, just to hear your thoughts and, and just check it out and see where it's coming from. But um, I guess my, my question is, and what I'm getting around to is you have been on a mission, right? You've been on a mission for a long time um, to get where you're at and to be able to drive this home. Uh, you've done a really, really good job of sticking to that mission or at least getting to it in maybe in the last 15 to 20 years you know exactly what that is. If you could sum that up for, for people, what would that be? Well, it's interesting to use the word mission. I absolutely, it's one of my favorite words. Um, and I don't know if you've read Chop Wood, Carry Water, yeah. but, but you know they talk about burn your goals and go on a mission. And, and I just love that, that whole idea because anytime you, know, anytime you think, that man, if I could just win a state championship. I mean, when I won my first state championship on the way home uh, on the bus in 1995, I was drawing out a plan for the next year. Because as soon as you get to what you think is your goal, you realize the goalpost is another 10 yards away. And, and so goals are frustrating, but a mission stays the same, whether you win or lose or championships or failures. Your, your mission stays the same. And, you know, I've, I've been on a mission coaching wise consistently throughout my career. And my father was too for 47 years as a basketball coach, but the feed the cats mission has, you know, what, what started out as, as a, a shameless attempt to get every great athlete in my high school to want to run track by telling them they wouldn't have to run <laughs> that all they had to do is sprint a couple times and go home. And we found out that kids got really fast and, and we beat the hell out of people because we had better sprinters than they did. Um, but all my slow kids improved the most. Mm -hmm. And so this feed the cats thing just grew and grew into something. Now, I mean, I did a, like a three hour zoom with the entire staff at the university of Pennsylvania in lacrosse, you know, it's like, th this is crazy stuff. You know, when I went over to England, you know, I was speaking mostly to rugby people. Um, and so I've been able to, um, to refine my message. And it's really a message of performance 
that we are going to perform in practice. And it used to be, it sounds crazy, but, but for a hundred years, all coaches wanted to do is get guys tired. They were all fatigue seekers. And, you know, now I say that any fool can get another fool tired. And so the whole idea that tired is the enemy, not the goal, I think really is revolutionary in sports. And I think back all the time, I'm probably like you are, where I remember every detail of my sports life as a teenager, every detail. And I, and practice sucked. And, and, but yet we bought into, it was supposed to suck because we got to play in games, got to run in track meets. And just imagine if I would have loved practice, how much better I could have been. And I'm sure of that. So, so that's the kind of stuff that fuels my mission. And, and then there's so many nice people that reach out and say that, that they have been reborn as a coach. And of course they are, because when you go to practice and your kids are enthusiastic and happy about your sport, you will automatically become a better, better coach. Coach, I, I love how, how you stated that. And, and just the breakdown of what a mission really looks like helps me formulate, you know, am I on the right track with that? And do I have a mission that is actually going to stand the test of time, right? Like, um, I love the uh, chop wood, carry water, uh, burn your goals. Both of those are, are awesome. And uh, maybe one of the, the key statements that sticks out to me the most, and I, I think this one's from Kier Wyndham Flats uh, podcast with you. And this, this might stick out to me the most just because it's so relatable to me. But you talked about how your dad jumped out of bed every morning, excited to go to work. Okay. And the more and more, or maybe the older I get, the more and more I see that that's not something that's normal. And, and I grew up in a household where I had two parents that did that where they were excited to go. And both of them just happened to be teachers. And, and that's why I'm, I'm a teacher is because I, I found that. And actually I have two younger brothers now that they both want to do it now too. Um, and you can probably relate. You have some sons that are track coaches now. Um, and why, why I think that's so important is because when you can jump out of bed in the morning, you know your mission, and then you get to go be around a bunch of kids that like are buying into what it really looks like to perform at a high level and to do it the right way. Like that's so fun. And it just like perpetuates it. It just keeps on building on top of that. It, you know, like, and that could be defined what your culture is possibly that we've talked about it up to this point. But if you could like nail down the word, and I know it's, it's this word that's thrown around all the time, but what would it feel like if you're a freshman going into your program? What would it feel like? What is the culture that your program is setting and, and how you want it to be uh, when they, when they go in and they learn about feeding the cats? Well, I, I think, you know, I, I say that happy and healthy is, is real important to feed the cats. And I don't mean happy in a goof around grab ass type of way. I, I mean that, that I want practice to be, um, the most not important, but the best part of a kid's day. And, and, I, and I felt that way in chemistry as well. And it's funny, you know, uh, I mean, I, I had to be a, an enthusiastic guy because, God, I had to teach chemistry and I had to coach track. And both of those things are not inherently fun. But, but for me to have the goal, um, and I've said this before, that, that it's almost like painted on, on my back wall in class was if your class was not mandatory, would the kids still come? And I, I, I think I asked myself that every day. I mean, I wanted to be their favorite teacher. I wanted to, chemistry to be their favorite class. And I think, I think that just absolutely starts to uh, snowball. And you say, you mentioned something that made me think of reflection. I think I think the best teams are, are teams where the athletes motivate their coach. You know, when, when, when kids motivate adults, adults get better. And so obviously as a coach, you want to motivate the kids as well. So uh, I really think that if, if we had a mission statement about culture, it is that kids are good at what they like to do. Uh, but they're obsessed with what they love. 
They're absolutely obsessed. And so if we can get kids to love our sport, they're going to be better athletes. And man, wouldn't it be nice if schools caught onto that? You know, schools are kind of like, yeah, kids hate school and that's okay. Uh, and instead of being like, no, if kids hate this class, we either get rid of the class or get rid of the teacher. Uh, that it is that important to the kids learning that, that they, I don't mean like they look forward to it because there's a party every day. I mean, they don't dread it. They, they're able to go in there and, and walk out saying, I like that kind of, you know, I, that's good stuff. And I guess that's all we can hope for. Uh, there's, there's a teacher at my high school that kids just year in and year out. Uh, he teaches American history, but he is so animated and he is so good at telling stories and captivating <laughs> not only their head, but their heart, right? Like he just wants to make sure that everybody there is cared for from, from the kid that, that always sits in the back and has their hood over their head to the person up front that's answering every question. And, and one of the things that I, that I find in that is he's also one of the most influential coaches that we have. We have, we have 25 guys on our varsity team. We'll, we'll dress that many all the way up where we'll add chairs at every basketball game because he has these kids that should never go out for basketball. They, they aren't even, even remotely close to being a varsity that they want to be a part of something like that. Right. And sometimes that's what I think about where you've only got a few slots for your sprinters at your school, but you're telling me you got 50 sprinters that are, that are out for your, you know, they're not all going to get spots, but they all want to be there. Right. And that's when, when I hear the numbers that you talk about, I'm like, how does that even work? It doesn't, but they love it still. Right. Like they want to be around their friends. They want to feed the cats. Um, maybe, maybe tell me a little bit more about that. And I think when, when you're saying that, I, I don't want to paint a picture that is, that is false. Mm -hmm. you, we, we fail. I mean, <laughs> there are kids that probably go home and say, I hate track. <laughs> you know, um, I, I don't like Coach Holler. I don't like track. As a matter of fact, I don't like his chemistry class either. <laughs> and we have to realize that, that just because that's our goal, and, and I mean, we want to succeed with as many kids as possible. Um, and, and so I, I don't want people to feel like you have to be, you know, 100% because you won't be. All, all we can do is be on that mission that we talked about and understand that, that if you are truly feeding the cats, which is really a, um, it, it's a way that we, we get them competitive um, we record and rank and publish the things they do, whether it's speed or how far they jump or, or how uh, high they jump or, or um, not just track times, but, but literally things we do in practice. We are always competing and we're not just competing one player against another by record ranking and publishing numbers. They are constantly competing with their former self. And so I, I say that when we time 40s and I think I've timed uh, something like 21,000 40s, no, 210,000 40s in the last 21 years, about 10,000 a year. And when my kids run a 40, they either curse or they celebrate because they either ran slower than their best time. Like, damn, bad, oh, what's wrong with me? Or, or they, they run their best time. And, and if you ever see like that, that fat kid from the football team break six in the 40 for the first time in his life, and he is feeling like a million bucks, you realize that this is something that kids need. And you're just constantly finding ways to, to celebrate performance. And I think when we do that, their game time performance gets better too. I, I find with timed sports that is so awesome to be able to find those little wins right like for track for cross country we just had a kid uh qualify for state in four events and uh sorry in swimming and i was talking to him i said okay so what do you rank going in he tells me all of his rankings all his times so what's the goal and he goes i want to beat my ranking like he wasn't worried about placing he wasn't worried he wants to beat his ranking going in okay he wants to beat his best times he he said he pr'd in his his relays and in his open stuff in every event, 
right? He PR'd at districts and he wants to do it again at state. And he's hooked. He loves it. He's like, so I was like, I don't know much about swimming, man, but I love track. And that sounds a lot. And he's like, dude, there's so many crossovers to track. And, and it was just fun talking to him because his eyes lit up. And maybe before we go a little bit further, I, I think it was super important that, that you painted the correct picture, right? This is not going to be the best thing for everyone. Some people are going to hate Tony Haller. Some people are going to hate Preston Peterson. Some people are going to hate the, the coach I was talking about. But truly, if, if our heart is on service to the athlete, if we're on our mission, I mean, we're doing the best we can at that point. Like, there's, there, I, so I think it's super important that you say that because there's people that I miss all the time. And, and I'm happy that you, that you remind me of that because that's something that still drives me forward too. You know, like that's the other thing is like, oh man, how can I get that kid then? You know, so I, I think that's, that's another good portion as we reflect and as we think about that stuff. How about this coach? Right now, there's a lot of there's a lot of different hot topics, and I just li- listened to maybe the the podcast that you just put out at the end of January. Um, I'm gonna forget the name of it and the guy that was the host, but it was a very solid one too. And he was he was asking you about um, a little bit about acceleration, a, a little bit about max velocity. You know, I talked to my dad before this, and you know, like one feeds the other one. And one doesn't, you know, like you get better at one, it doesn't always feed the other one. But if you get better at max velocity, it's always going to get better acceleration, right? So like people are probably tired about talking and listening to that. But I do think that we have a lot of strength coaches that listen to this podcast and they might want to hear this. So the shortest way possible, because I don't want to take too much time. I know how much effort you put into this recently, but maybe just to to clarify your points um, on that. And then we'll move on to maybe the next hot button hot button topic that you've got going on right now. Yeah, th- this was this was truly a Twitter war. This was <laughs> this was not a skirmish. Um, um, one of the problems and 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 I love S and C people. I mean meatheads are my best friends, you know? And and so um, <laughs> but anyway, um, S and C people, because they do not have a sprint speed background, and they do have a strength background, they, they first of all have a real problem with thinking that track and field simply reveals speed. You know, like, oh, if you're fast, you're going to be good in track. Um, but yet they see the weight room as not simply revealing strength, even though it does. Um, they think you can get stronger in the weight room, but they really, I don't think in their heart, they feel like they can get faster by running track. And if you have a track background, you know how crazy that is, that we see incredible speed growth. You know, like they say, oh, well, yeah, Tyreek Hill, he was a freak in high school. That's why he was fast. That's why he ran track. Well, yeah, but he might have got a little faster because he ran track. Matter of fact, I know he did. So so that's one of the problems. The other problem is, is that they that strength really has a lot of influence on acceleration. And so so weight room people really love acceleration. Then they also have this weird thing that somehow hitting top speeds are gonna get people hurt. And I've had two hamstring injuries um, in in those 210,000 sprints that I've timed in the last 21 years, I've had two hamstring pulls. And none in the uh, none with anybody that's done RPR before they ran. So, so anyway, it, it's just wrong. And and they say, well, uh, most guys are going at their top speed at 20, at, at the twenty yard mark. I, I, yeah, you're right. Most guys probably are. Well, then that's all you have to do because football and basketball and baseball they're all acceleration sports. I go, yeah, but the greatest impact on their athleticism will be top speed, maximum speed, and maximum speed will improve their acceleration. And it it drives people crazy. And I have to make stupid statements like acceleration does not improve your speed. So if you're just accelerating, you're not speed training. And then they blow up and say, ah, you know, if you're saying acceleration and speed training, then how are you ever going to get to that top speed? I go, oh my God, every time we get up to 23 miles an hour, We go, we accelerate like crazy to get there. And so you give me a bunch of 23 mile an hour athletes and we'll race you in 20s all day. 
because they're great accelerators. But if, if, you, if you're never spending time at that top speed, your ceiling of speed will never improve. And so to me, I'm like, okay, if I could get you to run two more seconds, okay, run that 20, run that acceleration, and then just stay at top speed for two more seconds. That's called a 40 yard dash. <laughs> and that's all you have to do. We're not asking for a change, you know, lobotomy here to change your thinking or something. It's just max speed is just really important. I see it just left on the table. I mean, uh, Boosh Exnader at our uh, consortium, he, he said that 75%, in his opinion, 75% of all NCAA football players never reach their ceiling of speed. And it's because of that, you know, we don't want to sprint stuff. We're going to get hurt if we go more than 20 yards. So, so that's, that ceiling is, is, is something that I call the tide that lifts all boats. Um, that extreme movement is how fast you can go. And as that extreme speed increases, you become more athletic in everything you do. Yeah, here's here's one of the things that stood out to me is like you say or Boo said seventy five, and I think maybe it's even higher. A experience that I had, I, I think it might have been higher because man, I was good at acceleration. Like we would time forties like once a year, right? Which for you, yeah. you're like, oh my gosh, yeah. seriously. And my strength coach um, is literally my my biggest mentor. I I love I love him to death because he has taught me so much. And you want to know something? Since I've left. They've started timing. They've started doing all these type of times. Um, there was a track coach. Um, I think his name is Brandon Masters. Uh, he was a he was a, he's an awesome track coach that came to Northwest, came in and started changing my strength coach's philosophy. And I wish I could go through right now. And maybe Joe will listen to this. Maybe you won't. But way, like I am super pumped up for it because now that I've learned more, I think I could have reached a little bit higher. And I think every one of my teammates could have reached a little bit higher. Um, and that's nothing against Joe. It's just where the field was at, at that time. There was, there was not enough people um, that, were, that were speaking these truths. And if you really think about this, is there anything that gives you a bigger response, maybe hormon hormonally, but definitely the central nervous system, nothing spikes like that other than pure sprinting, right? And that's, that is the fastest, the, the most stimulus, all of that. Why wouldn't you want to expose your, your kids to that? Why wouldn't you want to have that type of thing? Everybody wants to do like this heavy back squat where they get this hormonal, hormonal release. I mean, there is there is something to be said about just maximal sprint. Yes, and 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 I love lifting as well. You know, I, I just, I, I get the uh, uh, people dismiss me as being a just sprint guy and, and, and they just don't listen to me close enough. It's just that you're, Sprinting has to be your number one priority. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean you spend ninety percent of your day sprinting. It just means it's your priority. And and people say, "What's your theory? What, what what's your uh, general idea about lifting?" I said, "My general idea is just never let lifting mess with your sprinting." And and people think I'm being flippant, and I'm not. I'm just saying that if if maximum speed is your your goal, then your sprinting. You know, if you're doing stuff that makes you slower, then stop doing it. You know, it, it, and one, one of the things, too, when you're talking that I was thinking about is that sprinting. OK, first of all, it's not only safe, um, but it, it almost keeps you safe. One of the biggest problems in the NFL is they don't they don't sprint all week and then they sprint in the game and they get hurt. Well, if they were if they had the courage to sprint a couple times during the week at top speeds, they would be inoculated. They would, it would be like a vaccine against hamstring injuries. And then the other thing I wanted to mention, and this is really cool. I, I trained a kid for like 55 minutes or something one time this summer, and I videoed everything we did. I got home, I slapped it on, on an iMovie thing, edited out all the standing around, and it was 82 seconds long. He did 82 seconds of sprinting in 55 minutes. Now, I guarantee also that w when he left that workout, he felt better than he did when he got out of his car. He felt better leaving. So not only is it a low cost adventure, you're not gonna get hurt and, and you're not gonna be tired afterwards. You are actually primed to go in and lift weights. 
after a sprint workout. I have uh, uh, lacrosse kids that are, are sprinting in the morning and they have a lacrosse practice in the afternoon. And I said, does it take anything away from your, your lacrosse practice? And they go, no, I'm better. Oh like, yeah, because not only is there no cost, you almost get paid when you sprint. And, and if more strength people would understand that, you know, Buddy Morris, everybody's hero of the SNC world with the Cardinals, he says that sprinting drives weights. Weights do not drive sprinting. In other words, you will become better in the weight room, even if you're doing less by doing sprinting. But if you're thinking that, that all that lifting is going to make you super fast, you probably don't know much about sprinting. Um, maybe I, I've got two confessions for you. Okay. <laughs> Confession number one, um, I used to not like you uh, because I didn't think that you liked the weight room. And I felt like I was somewhat an athletic kid, but not really. And the weight room is what got me to the point where I felt like I could compete at the varsity high school level and then division two, right? Like I felt like the weight room was that for me, right? And I still think it is, okay? To be clear with that. But then I started listening to you more and more and more. And it's exactly what you said. Sprinting just needs to be the priority, okay? So that was a few years back now, okay? So, and then my, my second confession is I used to program all my strength stuff before my speed stuff, okay? That's not that long ago. I, I remember doing a presentation in 2018 and I'm almost sad to say this now, okay? I did this, what I felt like this awesome presentation of all of our strength-based stuff, right? My, my title is strength and speed coach, okay? At the time, what I did was I did this huge presentation of everything that we do for strength. And with the last five minutes, I said, okay, this is what we do for speed and that's it, okay? Which what we do for speed isn't that complex and probably only takes about five minutes, but it was not the emphasis. It was not prioritized. It was not the thing. I programmed everything for the weight room. This is 2018, right? Everything for the weight room before I would do anything with speed training before. Right. And like, that's totally been flipped on its head. Um, you know, like I'd like to say that um, I should have known better prior to that, but I just didn't know until I really started diving deeper into this. And um you know, some of my, some of my buddies within strength and conditioning world were like, okay, have you seen the high low model? Do you know what that looks like? What do you prioritize? What's going to hit the central nervous system the most? And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is of course, right? Like in the weight room, we prioritize Olympic movements a lot of times because it hits the central nervous system the most, but what hits more than a Olympic lifting, maybe more, right? Most of the time more sprinting, right? And so those are my two confessions. Uh, well, I, I think that's important. Confessions are really good for all of us. Um, and, and, you know, I was, uh, I was 40 uh, before I left the fatigue seeking. We're going to be tougher than everybody else. We're going to outwork everybody else. Um, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm just embarrassed as hell. I was 40. I mean, before, before I did something crazy and said, we're not going to get tired anymore. Tired is the enemy. So confessions are really important, but, but your experience, you know, I make fun of grinders, but almost every coach was a grinder as an athlete. I was, I mean, I was a grinder because that's was, that was our religion as an athlete. That's what we were preached to all the time that even, even if we won the game by 20 points, if we didn't out hustle the other team to every loose ball, then we were crap. And, and so, so it was constantly this outwork them, outwork them, outwork them thing. And most kids do not, did not find um, uh, uh, a great deal of glory on the track. I mean, it was typically reserved for the two or three fast guys in your school. And, and for the kids that the track embarrassed, um, they found their glory in the weight room. And the weight room, you know, I say speed grows like a tree. It, it grows, but most people aren't patient enough to stick with it. You know, well, the weight room, as you know, strength does not grow like a tree. Strength grows by leaps and bounds, and you can see it in the mirror. And, and that hormonal response 
is so important, especially for guys. I mean, testosterone is what we make, what makes us feel like a man. And we had a little more testosterone in our body when we walked out of the weight room, you know? And so, so those things really color our thinking in the future when it comes to making speed the priority. Yeah, that's a, maybe that's a super important note. I used to think that strength was the base of everything, which I still, this is going to be one of my questions later on is what this is, what does this look like? Uh, incoming freshman, seventh and eighth grade, because I still think there's like this, this portion where they need a strength base. I, honestly, they do to be able to compete at a varsity level, or at least maybe that's my thoughts. I want to hear yours. Um, but I do also think that, you know, like there's no reason that you can't start speed training, maybe even earlier than what a lot of people ever say about strength training, right? And mm-hmm. uh, I love the no cost, you actually maybe get paid type of situation. I mean, right now with my two-year-old, we do plyometrics, we it. hop over things. We, we, we are bunnies. We, we do like little things like that. And um, we sprint down the hall. Uh, do you want to run? Yes, let's run. You know, like all these little things that there is no negative part to that ever, right? Um, that That is just like building him up to be, you know, like be able to do and move the ways that he needs to move. And um, I guess all of this is, is coming down to what does it really look like? I, w- I would imagine, you know, as you have done this with a ton of 14 and 15 year old, 15 year olds going into this, what does it look like um, to have a strength base to, um, to say that, yes, this is important, um, but, you know, speed training just is important, maybe more important, especially from a younger age. What, how, do, how do you mesh that up? Well, What's that look like? To you? your, your question goes back. Uh, I joke with people. I'm in the freshman football hall of fame as a coach. Um, I, I was maybe the best freshman high school football coach in the history of the game. Um, I mean, we, we yeah. Anyway, I, I won't brag about our numbers, but we once won a game 86 to seven. So, um, and, and that was with a running clock in the second half. Um, they kept throwing though, you know, they shouldn't have done that. But anyway, um, the, one of the greatest things for my track program is I got to meet up with 65 freshman boys in early June for 25 contact days. And our, this will kind of show you what, what prioritizing speed and how it fits in with strength is all about. We went 40 minutes on the track, speed workout, like an 82 second workout that take, took 40 minutes. Time and guys, three sprints, five minutes rest in between the three sprints, 40s, 10 meter flies, whatever. Um, we did that with, we called them the faster half. You know, it was like the key players, you know, you have to make some, you know, like, you know, I hate to say it, but you, you have to say, okay, this half the player is going to win games for us and this half is not. So they're going to get a little bit of a priority training wise. So they got to sprint train first while the other guys were in the weight room. Okay. And then after 40 minutes, took about five minutes to change spots. Then the kids that are in the weight room came out and sprint trained, not ideal, but they're still getting sprint training, which in most schools, they get none like zero. They're still running three time sprints. We're still record rank publish. They're, they're still getting faster. They still appreciate it in the weight room. I was not in the weight room. I was on the track. My assistant coaches, they were told to teach, to teach kids how to lift that we are not trying to, uh, to have huge lifting gains in 25 sessions over the summer. We are going to teach kids. We're going to build the foundation that they can be better and better lifters and maybe lifelong lifters by doing things right. We are not going to sit around and talk as coaches while they're, they have this prescribed lifting thing. We, we are not going to ever let anybody squat with too much weight. We are not ever going to let anybody squat the wrong way. And they say, well, what, coach, what, what exact list? I said, I really don't care. Just do the, just do the core stuff, you know, they teach them how to bench and squat and clean and blah, blah, blah. And then, and then we would go out for 45 minutes of football, specific football stuff. And my goal was to find out, have an idea who's going to play what position and to basically install five running plays and five pass plays 
you know, where we could actually go into a game by the end of the summer and have a basic offense to run. You know, I, those were my things. So, so really it was a third, a third, a third. Now, which third was the most important? I think the sprint stuff was, you know, that was the most important, but are we neglecting strength? No. And here's one other thing that I would tell them, this is on the first day of practice. And as you know, in season, it really gets tough to lift. You know, you know, when you're going to lift, weight rooms never open. So on the first day of practice, I said, okay, um, um, I, I got a challenge for you. 100 push-ups a day for 100 days. I said, if you do that, it'll change your life. You will be a different person in 100 days. And I, I believe that. I believe there's some hormonal thing that happens. I believe, I just really believe it. And I said, how many of you guys are going to do that? All 65 guys raised their hand. And I said, bullshit. About five of you. About five of you are going to do that. But I still need to tell you that because the five guys who do it are going to be new men. And because I handled it like that and I was honest, um, I think probably 15 did it. And, and I, you know, that's what coaches have to do. It goes back to what we were saying. We're not going to reach everybody. But, but I really do believe that <laughs> football players that are not strong are not going to be very good football players. So, so you integrate it like that. And then we go into the winter, you know, like in between football and, and track. We do an hour of speed training, hour of lifting, same type of thing, faster guys on the track first, bigger guys, slower guys, younger guys in the weight room first, and then we flip flop. We go Monday through Thursday. So equal time in the weight room and on the track, but what's our priority? Well, I tell the football coach every year, don't screw up my speed sessions. He goes, what do you mean? I said, don't crush them until Thursday. Because I know that every football coach wants to crush their kids. They get off on that. You know, like if, if you're going to squat and do all kinds of stuff where they're going to have a 48 hour flu afterwards, do it on Thursday because we have Friday, Saturday, Sunday off. So once again, that's what I mean about prioritizing speed. It's not neglecting strength. You know, I think strength is fantastic, but, but you're still, that speed is really important. No, I like that. It, it makes a lot of sense to me. And, and one of the things that maybe stands out to me with that is, um, you know, giving the kids what they need as they need it and just prioritizing it well. And that's something that I was lacking for a while, um, which this kind of draws me into my next question a little bit, because um, we have a, a cool, really cool situation at Mount Vernon. And you'll see this after the Super Bowl because they'll show everybody um, all the multi-sport athletes. One of our actually, let's just plug it in right now. One of our former athletes was in the Super Bowl. Guess what? He was a multi-sport athlete. Um, so it's, it's really cool to see. Um, but we have so many multi-sport athletes at Mount Vernon. Actually, they're involved in everything. They're involved in band, they're in choir, they're in orchestra, and they are a three to four sport athlete. It's no joke. That's the way our community is. And I absolutely love it. But at the same time, that it's a, like a little bit different of a feel of when do we train? When does it look like? What does it look like to fit our situation? And I just want to hear maybe your thoughts on that. If you had a true multi-sport athlete that's going from football to basketball to track, and then in Iowa, we have summer baseball. So literally you can be a four sport athlete and just go year round. What does it look like for speed training um, primarily? Because I, I feel like I've, I've started to shift and I kind of have an idea of how I'm going to do strength training, but I still don't know what it looks like to grow like a tree in speed training. Yeah. I think one of the, one of the key things um, that I talk to when I remote coach, some lacrosse kid that's going to Duke next year. You know, I, um, you know, I, I say you've got to find times during the week when you can train fresh. And as you know, for a multi-sport athlete, that's hard. Uh, it, it could be that they can't train fresh ever. And so you just have to trust that that sport is giving him so many great things that that's going to be okay. Um, or it could be that, that, okay. Uh, you have a double header tonight. It's summertime. Um, would it be better to speed train this morning or tomorrow morning? I'd say this morning would be better. So we have to, you know, what time in the morning? Well, what time do you feel best? <laughs> I mean, like, what time do you, are, are you bouncing around? So those are the kinds of prioritization things that I think we got to get across to kids. And, you know, I mentioned the push-up thing. You know, like sometimes 
it, weightlifting is just like sprinting. You can't get kids in the weight room because they're too damn busy. Well, get them doing push-ups, challenge them, have them report to you how many push-ups they did every day. Um, and, and then there's a story, uh, one of the best athletes I ever coached was a three-sport athlete, um, football, basketball, and track, state champion in track, just a monster dunker in basketball. And they played with the Vikings. So he was obviously a great football player. And I'll never forget this. Um, when I was coaching at Harrisburg, Illinois, school of 600 kids, um, we had a pole barn out by the football field. And I used to go there and lift at nights because I live like right across the street. And, and I would go in there and I would see Braden. He would walk in after basketball practice at 530. And he would walk in, it's a great story. He would walk in with a can of tuna and eat tuna out of a can, pure protein. And I said, so, so Braden, you are eating tuna out of a can. Why? And he's a doctor's kid. So he wasn't poor or none. And I said, why didn't you go just go home and eat? He said, coach, because I really need to lift. I think my future is in football. Um, and if I went home, I don't think I'd come back. And I was like, damn, you know, the great ones really do find ways to get things done, but you gotta be smart with it. You know, we, we had a great quarterback here whose dad played at the university of Minnesota for Lou Holtz, uh, way back in the day. But, he, you know, this guy had a 10 year NFL career. He would take his son out every morning at 6 AM and running during the season, because that's what Lou Holtz did to them at Minnesota. And that's what made him tough. And that's what made him a man. And all it did for his boy was making him a step slow. You know, and, and so you got to have the, you can't just have priorities. You have to have the right ones. And that's why, that's why we read and talk to people and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, so the easy answer is it's got to fit. It's got to fit your schedule and the, the options that you have have to be prioritized right. Right. I, I feel like you know, sometimes I overthink things. Um, sometimes I'm like, okay, this, this is not going to work the way that I want it to, because I want it to be perfect. Honestly, in my mind, that's what I want. But obviously, you know, just hearing you say it puts me a little bit more at ease that we're on the right track with our stuff. We're, we're heading in the right direction. And realize, realize coach that, that those multi-sport athletes, especially if they're getting to play. I mean, if, if they're the 12th man on the basketball team, I'm not so sure that basketball helps them. You know, I hate to say that, but if they're getting to play, they are gaining things. That I don't think me and you can give them. I mean, I, I just think that, that, that I am such a multi-sport warrior and it's not just because it's educationally sound, which it is. And I fight people. I block people on Twitter that speak against multi-sport. I block them. I, I, I fight them. I mean, I, I almost blocked here when I'm flat last night. Uh, I saw that actually. <laughs> I, 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 he could tell I was pissed too. I was really pissed. And, <laughs> and but I'm just such a believer in the educational value of sports, not just, you know, like, hey, we want to get to the next level and win a scholarship. No, it, it's a it's the greatest classroom ever invented. But I also believe, and I said earlier, that track makes you faster. And the basketball makes you quicker and a better multi-directional guy and a better jumper and a better, better catcher of the ball. And the football makes, you know, football just doesn't reveal talent. Football improves talent, you know, and you can say that about wrestling. I had a kid one time that wrestled and he was a great hurdler. And, and I was like, gee, he could probably be state champion if he quit wrestling and hurdled more in the winter. But I, I just tamped it down and he wrestled. And he was state champion in the hurdles. You know, we just have to trust it that, that, you know, even wrestling that doesn't seem like it's very track specific is still damn good for kids. No doubt. I, and I love, I really do love the multi-sport mindset. And I love, and that's part of the reason why I love my community so much is because everybody wants to be a part of something and everybody wants to do it together. And I think that's something that is really hard to teach and there's a lot of confidence that comes from that, like just being exposed to a lot of those things. And it got me thinking about when you were saying the hundred pushups and how much like almost made them feel like a man after they had completed that challenge, basically is what it was. It was a challenge, right? 
the, the number one most transferable trait, and you'll even hear strength coaches say this about the weight room is confidence, right? When they can look in the mirror, that, and it's, it's not that their squat went up or their bench or their deadlift or anything. It's, it's, it's more so when they look in the mirror, they feel confident, right? Like that's so cool. And, and one of the things that, that I think about, um, there's a guy named Jeff Jones. He's a, he's a high school strength coach in Iowa now, but he's been at every level of collegiate strength um, and conditioning. And he talks about athlete, the lower and body build the upper. And it's kind of like speak what you just said, where you want the lower to be springy. You want to do it. But honestly, how much is your upper body really doing when you're sprinting max velocity? I mean, it, it's important. It's important, but it's not like as important. And it's not going to wreck your central nervous system when you, when you train upper body. Right. So I love when he, I wrote that down, I've got it up on my wall. Now athlete, the lower body build, the upper, because everything that you want, now you get the confidence, the kids that are looking for, they get that. And they kind of get that, that itch that everybody wants to, to scratch um, in the weight room where it's like, man, this guy, I want it tough. I want it to be so tough, right? You get a little bit of that, but then you also see like their athletic performance go way, way, way up. And, and that's something that I've stole from him. And I think that could be, I, I think that could be something that um, you pair up with oh. feed the cats and it's just- You know, and, and when thing. you said that, my mind immediately, I don't know why, went to, you know, like a lot of times we will bust out new speed suits for like sectional or something. And I guarantee my guys are going to run faster than they've ever run their life because they, they look good and they feel good about it. It's the same way when you feel good about your body, you know, when, when you feel, I mean, I, I've, I've lifted weights for, I don't look like it, but I've lifted weights for 45 years and it, it's a great feeling to walk out of the weight room. You just feel you know, like, yeah, you just feel invincible or something. And that's a great feeling for any athlete. So I, I, I think I'm scoring some weightlifting points tonight. This has been good for me. Yeah. And not that I'm trying <laughs> to bridge any, bridge any gaps. I'm, I'm really not. Okay. But it's just because my dad was, uh, was a track coach, but he was also kind of, he was him and another guy were my strength coaches. Yeah. I mean, he was just a coach that wanted his players to be better. Let's say it like that. Okay. He's not a strength coach. He's more so and I mean, he'll listen to this, okay? And he's, he's so pumped for this. He's like, are you you're talking to Tony? <laughs> okay, but he's not a strength coach. And he'll be honest with that. He is just a coach that wants his players to be the best that they can be in everything, right? And so he is so pumped up about learning about Feed the Cats. He's so pumped up about figuring out what's the best way to implement. And um, he gave up his prep, he gave up his planning period so that he could do the uh, performance class at the high school. Um, so it's a small school. They only have like one class period of it during the day. And my dad doesn't have a prep anymore because he wants to be a part of that. It like, it's one more thing that like just makes him want to jump out of bed. And I'm appreciative of that because I think it's such a cool deal. Um, where I'm going with this is he is an old guy now and he'll laugh at that too. He's an old guy now, but he still wants to learn. Wait, how old He's, is, how old is old though? Oh, I don't, I don't want to throw you under the bus at all. Okay. But <laughs> I mean, you know, cause I used to I think don't like 45 was like way <laughs> over the hill and I'm 62 now. So anyway, yeah, careful he's, with that. he's, he's 53, he's 53. Okay. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> so, so um, don't compare, I guess, it's but, good. Uh, but he is always looking for that edge. He just wants to know. And, and, um, he's always looking at professional development. What does that look like to be the best that it can be for you where you've got your mission, you've kind of, you've really made this brand. You, you know, if you want to call it a brand or not, you really know what you want out of stuff, but you're also still trying to learn. And you're still like with all the TFC stuff that you guys put on and all the clinics and all the learning that you do. Um, tell me about that. What are some of your, your favorite professional development resources? What does that look for like for you who, you know, you've developed so much of this stuff. What does that look right. like to continue to learn? Well, I, I think that the stronger your foundation, and, and you're right, I, I'm almost nauseatingly uh, confident in, in, in where, where I am, but I also took 67 pages, full pages of notes from 2019 presentations at TFC. Um, and I wrote down stuff I didn't even agree with because I'm still learning. You know what I mean? So I think the track football consortium is, is brilliant. We just stumbled into it, but it's brilliant because 
it brings so many, like one, one time we had an Olympic bronze medalist synchronized swimmer speak. Now that's, that's the courage to step out. You know what I mean? And you know what? She was really good. And I think people, people learn from getting out of their silo and, and for a strength coach to listen to a, a crazy sprint, I mean, a, a strength coach to listen to a sprint coach, a sprint coach to listen to a meathead, you know, to bring in rugby people. We had my, I think my favorite presentation was Mike Whiteman, um, the SNC coach for the Pittsburgh Riverhounds soccer. He was fabulous. I'll, I'll never, I always, he says, my goal as an SNC coach for soccer is to, is to get my kids to lift heavy, sprint fast, jump high, jump far. And with that, we will create an apex predator. <laughs> and I'm like, I will, for, I will forever remember that. So anyway, there's all those great opportunities now, so much more than when I was growing up. I mean, we had like nothing. And, and, and there's so much out there now, but I, I do want to say that the absolute number one professional development is to visit great coaches. And it's, it's fun to have breakfast with them. It's even more fun to drink a beer with them. But the most important thing is to watch them coach, you know, to go and <laughs> I mean, like, I go and, and sit in Chris Corfus basement. I spent over a hundred hours in his basement, maybe 200 hours. And I just watch and I'll say, why are you doing that? Well, what, 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 what's your, what's your focus here? You know, like I, I will make him talk. And I have learned so much from simple observation of great coaches. And you think back and you think, God, you know, when I was coaching three sports and I had four kids, I wasn't visiting anyone. Well, I take that back. I, I would drive to Bloomington, Indiana and, and watch Bobby Knight practices. So I guess I did do that a little bit. And I learned so much from Bobby Knight. That was before he would turn crazy though. I mean, he's totally nuts now, but and has been for 20 years. But back then he was the best basketball coach, the best teacher I've ever known. And I just learned so much from watching him coach. That's, that's, uh, that's a great point. And, you know, like in the state of affairs that we are right now with the pandemic is, is such a, a weird thing because we've, we've had basically almost a year now where we've sat behind computer screens. Um, we've learned from a ton of people, but I still think the hands-on seeing somebody interact with their athletes is such an important deal. Um, I think one of the first times I ever actually got to see it as a, like a structured thing is we would do like intern swaps and we would do site visits um, when I was an intern at uh, Northwest Missouri State. And it was so like, I don't know, it was, it, it was earth shattering how much uh, there was for me to learn at that time because I was just seeing a coach that did it completely different than what I learned in high school and what I had learned up to that point in college. And um, I think you're right. And I think that has to be one of the things that we continue to do. So it's great to go to clinics. It's great to listen to podcasts, um, but reaching out directly to coaches and going in and checking what they are actually doing, um, I think is so cool. And really that's the, those are the ones that I remember the most. Like I remember every coach that I've went to and visited now. And those are the people I, I talk to on a regular basis now because I trust what they do, right? Like it's- and not Don't kid yourself. Those coaches that you visit are so honored that you're there i mean like like when when i have a visitor i don't care where he's from middle school i don't care i am so honored that 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 yeah it just it makes my day you know and, and because nobody gives a crap about about a track coach but if somebody's visiting you know it's like man this is this is cool and and i just think that uh, the the more you know like nobody should be afraid of reaching out and saying, coach, could I come visit your practice sometime next week? Because people love it. That's sweet. And, and honestly, um, the more that you uh, reach out to coaches, right? There's so many coaches that sometimes they just, they, they get in a funk, they struggle. Um, I think about this maybe through the COVID time, there was, there was a couple of times where I'm just like, man, 
this isn't the way that it's supposed to feel. Some, and just to have somebody reach out to you and, and just talk with you is, is a super um, encouraging thing, right? Just to see what you're doing, how you do it, that type of stuff. And it's like, relights a fire in you. And you're like, man, I just needed that. I need a little bit of that. So um, maybe that's a little bit of plug for everybody just to get out and, and go see some coaches. What do you think, coach? Oh, for sure. And, <laughs> and I, I think that's one of the great things about our consortium is that for some reason, people don't treat it like a normal clinic. They, they treat it like they've joined something. Mm-hmm. And, and like they're, they feel, I mean, I'm, I'm answering emails about an hour a day now. And, and it is, uh, it's a labor of love. Now, if I was still teaching five classes of chemistry, it would be much more of a burden, you know? Uh, yeah, I'd have to assign a test or something in order to have time to reply to everybody. But, but now that I'm retired, it's, it, it's fun. And it, it, it helps me to like improve my message too, because we're all searching for better ways to say something, clarifying things or being more descriptive. And oh, another thing I was going to say about visiting a coach, really good coaches don't even know that they're doing a bunch of really good things. They're so used to the nuances of, of what they do that, that when somebody comes and visits, they'll say, man, I love the way you blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, I, I've never really thought about talking about that, but yeah, that's why I do it. And, and so those are things that you catch if you visit somebody. That's awesome. And, and one of the things that I think about is how much I've changed as a coach. And I bet you there's some things that, that I don't do now that used to be really good stuff that I should be doing. Right. I got, I've got stuff that I'm, 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 I still need to improve on. Right. But there's, there's things that I've, I used to be good at it. And I bet you, I just don't put as much emphasis on that now. And so I have to, I have to rethink through those things. So having conversations with other coaches, I think that's, that's important. Yeah. Right. Coach, um, conversation up to this point has been a lot of where you're where you're at where you're going what's it look like to go on that ride with you um and one of the biggest questions that i ask every show um and it's it's a it's a hallmark question of of our podcast is because we want coaches that are on this show um to make the big time where they're at that's why they're on the show they they've made the big time where they're at it doesn't matter um who they are, where they're from, they are just doing the best that they can with what they have. Um, coach, if, if you could answer that question, what, what would you say? How are you making the big time where you are? Well, I, I think it all just goes back to being on a mission. And, and my mission now, your mission changes a little bit. Um, uh, my, don't take this the wrong way, but uh, when, when I speak at clinics, sometimes I, I will make fun of other clinic speakers and say, you know, most of these guys come up and say, hey, if you take one thing home from my talk, it's been a good clinic. I'm like, BS, no way, man. I'm gonna give you a million things. Matter of fact, I'm here to change your life today. And, and I mean, that's kind of an arrogant thing, but, but I, I kind of go around now, uh, I feel so strongly um, that we need to improve uh, the practice world of kids. Um, and, 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 and their school world as well into something they look forward to that, that it almost gives me like this evangelical flair, you know, like I'm a preaching at a tent revival or something. And, and it's not, it's not staged. It's, it's truly, you know, like my mission has actually become more and more, you know, really out to change the sports world and the educational world. And it's not, it's not anything complex. It's just a different way to think about things uh, where we care about the things that matter the most. And, and I don't know for sure in school, we've never got around to doing that or still fixate on curriculum and standardized testing. It makes me want to spit, but, but, you know, uh, I, I think, I think the sports world is starting to change, um, you know, where, where practices are becoming more, um, uh, performance-based and, and we care more, you know, and, and so I think that's really, really important that, uh, that's how, that's how I'm trying to make a difference. And, you know, when you ask that question, I don't know if you want me to go in this direction or not, but, you know, I have a really good friend 
that's really, I, I didn't even know him until three years ago. So I was 59 before I met him. His name is Brad Dixon. And Brad Dixon coaches at Camp Point Central. And that's a school of 263 kids. And he is making such a difference in those kids' lives. And he has become really the, uh, the, the main man of the entire sprint-based football movement and has put out so much great content. And we, our football job was open two years ago. And I said, Brad, what would it take to get you here? He said, coach, I, my wife's from Camp Point. I really love it here. You know, so, I mean, he, you know, you don't have to go to the big time. Uh, I was I was asked to apply for the Notre Dame track job a couple years ago, and I didn't apply. I because I think Plainfield North is a is a better gig, you know I really do, and uh, people probably think that's weird, but um, but yeah I think that that you know you need to grow where you're planted, and we all have our own places. I'm jealous of you getting to uh, the type of high school that you get to work at. Uh, sounds amazing. Um, and yeah, don't ever think that just because there's 10 times more kids at some school, that it's going to be a better situation. Coach, I, I like that. Um, no, but always when I hear a coach that has been doing this for a long time and does it for the right reasons is a, uh, is not a transactional coach. Um, it always gets me pumped up because I know that, I can do it long-term when I see somebody else do it. Like somebody's paved the way for me to continue on doing that. You know, uh, my dad is one of those big time people in my life, right? Um, hearing you say that and, and being on a mission and, and wanting to change the sport world and doing a great job of doing that, right? Like it's, it's something that just fires me up and it, it makes me want to strive harder and strive more and, and, and know that um, I think all of this has a purpose and really when you say like practices and sports in general are the best classroom, you know, like that's what we want is we want, we want our people, we want our student athletes to be the best that they can be in every situation. And that's so cool um, to hear people that want that and to be on that, that ride with them, you know, in a small way, me listening to a bunch of your podcasts and reading a good chunk of your articles, you know, like some small way I get to be a part of that. So um, I'm, I'm super appreciative of you coming on before, before we go, um, I've got some finisher questions and then I want, I want to put out, you know, like the best ways to get a hold of you and maybe the best places to read your articles. I know you've got them on a few different sites. Um, but I also want you just to be able to say any other piece that you want people to know. Um, you know, like, I know, I know you get to say a lot. Okay. But there's some times where you just want to be like, okay, if I could narrow everything down, this is what I want people to know or to leave people with what you got. Well, okay, uh, I'm, I'm kind of I'm, I'm kind of lost there because maybe I have too many things to say to say just one thing. Um, uh, it's definitely that you got you got to find something you like and get good at it. You know, uh, uh, I, I think that you kind of touched on it. I think coaches are typically transactional, and and I know I was as a younger coach. Uh, I did it for the wins, you know, I, I did it, you know, uh, for the glory. Uh, it was, you know, I, I was, I was a player, you know, I, I, that was coaching basically. And, um, and I, I think that's normal. And I think once again, confessions are good. Uh, you know, that, that the great thing is the less transactional you are and the more kid centered you are, the more wins you will have. I mean, it's weird that as soon as you, you know, stop focusing on the goals, uh, as soon as you surrender to the results, that's another thing in chop wood, carry water, burn your goals, go on a mission and surrender to the results. As soon as you surrender to the results, uh, things are going to work out better. Um, and, and happy, healthy kids really perform well. So I, I think, you know, I say those things all the time, but you know, if there, if there's one thing I need to say, it'd be that. I like it. I love how you wrapped it up. That was very good. 
All right, so before we go, here's some just quick things. Um, we have your favorite book first on the list. Can you narrow that down to one? I know you're a reader. Can you narrow it down to your favorite book? Um, uh, I, I would, if I narrow it down to one, I've read a thousand books in my life. Uh, it would be Pillars of the Earth. I've, I've read it twice. Ken Follett wrote it. Doesn't sound real great. It's about the building of medieval churches, cathedrals in the 1300s. Um, but it's it's a page turner. I loved it. I've read it twice. But uh, that would probably, when people push me to name one book, it's Pillars of the Earth. Great. I'll have to look at that one. I'll have to check that out. Okay. Oh, you'll love it. That's awesome. All right. Um, person that's influenced you the most. Uh, uh, the person that's influenced me the most for sure is my father. You know, I, th I think, I think you have probably a very similar, um, were you the oldest? I was, I am. Okay. Yeah. Enough said. So when, when you're the oldest son of a coaching father, um, your life is hallways and gymnasiums and locker rooms and school buses and glorious games and you know like after the game you're shooting around in the dark while the janitor's sweeping the floor you know it's just um i you know i it, it was just a glorious now actually playing for my father was one of the hardest things because i think i wanted to win more for him than for me and so it's kind of like double pressure i had the pressure to play well and i had i felt my dad's pressure to win as well so playing for my dad was really hard, um, but being a coach's son was the most glorious thing. Um, and, you know, I, I just, I absorbed everything he ever said and everything he ever did. It's, it's crazy how a single person can make it such a big impact on somebody's life, right? I, oh, yeah. We're, we're both, you know, like uh, totally unbalanced humans now because, of, <laughs> because, because we had coaching fathers, right? <laughs> maybe that's why i'm so messed yes. up that's good i mean it, it all goes back to the past experiences right you should be a psychologist <laughs> you know. that, that's just easy that's low-hanging fruit there <laughs> all right coach what's your favorite quote you know i i i want i, I want to say it right because uh it just happened like two weeks ago brad stolberg who's a great writer um he has a couple great books um he, he tweeted this and Twitter is a great quote machine. You know, he said, Twitter is great if you follow the right people and awful if you follow the wrong people. So the two rules of Twitter are simple, follow the right people and ruthlessly unfollow the wrong people. And I quote tweeted him and said, substitute life for Twitter. And and I was humbled that he replied. He says, your quote's much better. <laughs> you know, so, so basically, I mean, if you think about it, it it's so true about Twitter, right? I mean, there, there's a wealth of information, but man, there's so much toxic stuff out there that you got to block, mute, unfollow, whatever. And if you think about it, that's the same thing we've always done, or at least if you're a healthy human, is you got to you got to avoid toxic people and you got to find the right people to follow and to be around and have as your friends. And uh, I don't know if we think about that enough. You know, we always tell kids, don't be hanging around with the wrong crowd. But I think it's a, a better thing to say, find the right people, find the right people to follow. Um, and then do whatever you can to avoid the bad ones, you know? And I think, I, I think that's kind of a, a good life lesson. I love it. I actually screenshotted that. I, I, uh, it came across because you, you quote tweeted it and, uh, I screenshot it and, and that's, uh, it's one of the ones I, I'll go back to it. All those, all those like little things. I'm like, man, that was, that's <laughs> solid. <laughs> Very good. Um, what's your, uh, what's your favorite hobby? I, I'm really, really boring. Um, um, reading and running, uh, believe it or not as a sprint coach, I, I say, I, I teach racehorses, but I'm a workhorse. And, and, um, and even though I'm never, I've never been a good runner, I've run four marathons and I don't know if I ever feel better than I feel when a run is over. I hate the run itself, but then when it's over, when you're sweaty and you take a shower, you just feel that's your best hour of the day. So, and then 
also uh, for my brain, reading is so important because I have a tendency, like I think a lot of reading is what kind of grounds me, you know, and, and anytime I'm a little bit messed up, it's, I, I realize I'm not reading. <laughs> I, I need to sit and read more. So I, I think it's, it's kind of like therapy. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I think I could relate to everything except for the running. I, I cannot. <laughs> I, I'm completely against it. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Because like I say, I hate every step of it. I really hate it. And, <laughs> but it, I, I love it when it's over. And I just got into the bad habit of it. You know, like the whole running craze started in the mid 70s. I mean, there was no such thing as marathons like in 1973. And all of a sudden Nike came around, started selling running shoes and people started running. And, you know, 50 years later, people are fatter than they've ever been. Isn't that weird? I mean, like all the running that people do, I think it's making us fat, but what do I know? I think there's a lot of things at play. And <laughs> that's after you, after you get feed the cats spread to the world, maybe your next one is, okay, how are we going to solve obesity? So, Oh, one, one thing at a time, man. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> um, you've mentioned a few coaches on this podcast, uh, but this is one of the ways that we continue to build our list. And, and I want to make sure that, that um, this, this coach gets a shout out too. who's a small coach, small school coach who's killing it and deserves a shout out. And that could be any small college, any high school, um, just a coach that's, that's doing great things. Well, since I already burned Brad Dixon, um, that, that would be amazing. And, and the other guy, um, and, and, you know, I, I don't think he needs a shout out because he is like, like becoming bigger than life. Um, uh, that's Dan Casey, um, a good friend of mine from Raleigh, North Carolina. And, um, and even though he's like one of the most famous football coaches in the United States right now with his content and his brilliance, um, Dan, um, I believe, I believe he coaches eight man football in Raleigh, North Carolina. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Like you talk about grow where you're planted, man. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just beautiful. You know, and you talk about the way things happen. Like he read an article that I wrote and, um, and called me, just called me and we talked for a couple hours and we've been friends ever since. And, and, um, and you know, that, that's, that, that's how, that's how we develop our inner circle. That's how we follow the people. Um, we follow the people we need to follow the good people, the, the good Twitter accounts is, is, you know, we pick up the phone once in a while and we reach out. That's awesome coach. All right. So we've got, we've got the finishers, um, the finisher questions wrapped up. And now the, the next step would be. Um, just ways that people can learn more, right? They're going to listen to this and they're going to be like, man, I want more. How, how do I listen to or learn more from Tony Holler? What's your, what's your go-to thing? For well, that? in August, I started through CoachTube. Um, the guys at CoachTube told me that How Mummy made a ton of money um, uh, selling his air raid certification stuff. And they told me that I, I could make a ton of money selling my <laughs> feed the cat certification stuff. So as of now, I think I have 12 article, 12 courses uh, on coach tube and, and they're all presentations. Uh, Brad Dixon did a three and a half hour sprint based football presentation. So they're not all my, like four of them are authored by other people. Um, but my stuff is, is put out there as detailed as I've ever put anything out. And I, I've gotten really good feedback. And uh, so those coach tube courses are really good. I'm easy to, uh, to reach uh, tony.holler at yahoo.com. Um, I, I put my cell phone number out there to everybody, 630-849-8294. And um, uh, if, if you Google my name or Google feed the cats, um, somebody told me the other day that Feed the Cats gets um, Google search 600 times a month now. Um, so it's, it's out there, you know, and, and it's pretty easy to, to find that stuff. And um, I answer emails and I answer, 
if I don't answer the phone, you leave a voicemail or whatever, and I get back to people. That's awesome. Coach, um, so appreciative of your time. Uh, I know, you know, like with your mission to help the world, uh, I hope this helps um, get you toward that miss mission. I want to, I want you to know that um, taking the time to do this means a lot to me. Uh, I'm excited to re-listen to it, redo my notes and, and uh, put this out for people just to learn from you more. So coach, once again, thank you. Well, thank you. I had a great time as you could tell. <laughs>